two. Okay, that's how we do it. One, three, five, and so on. So in any case, you get one plus three plus two n minus one plus two n plus one. So that's a n plus one. Now your induction hypothesis tells you that this is actually uh, so this is a n first, okay, plus two n plus one, and the induction hypothesis says that a n is b n. So we can re replace a n by b n, and we get two n plus one, and b n is n squared by definition. And so we get n plus 1 to the square, okay, the well-known identity, n square plus 2n plus 1 is n plus 1 square. So this is bn plus 1. So by the induction principle, an is equal to bn for all n. Questions? By the way, these, these, uh, these justifications, when you say by definition, by property, by theorem, you need to, to keep those right. In, in, uh, in the homework you are uh, getting now that I graded this week, uh, lots of people would say my uh, sequence is monotone and bounded. Therefore, by definition, it converges. No, that's not the definition of convergence. Okay, it's a property. It's a theorem. Okay, it's not a definition. Okay, it's it's not crucial. I'm not taking off point because of that. But it's good for you to have precisely in your mind what the definition is, what the theorem is, what the property is. Okay, it helps you organize your ideas. At the end of this course, you have to know to have memorized quite a bit of information. So if you have it well organized, I think it's easier to memorize because you. It's uh, at least that's how computers work. So uh, number two, number two, we have information about absolute value of y and absolute value of x minus y, and we'd like a bound on absolute value of x. Uh, many times. The way to do these problems is really to, to start with uh, the, maybe you, you want something on absolute value of x, and introduce what you have. What you have is x minus y and y. Okay, so that's not natural, okay, it's not something you are going to think of if you haven't never seen it, but we have done this now, sometimes. So you must think of that now. And now you use the triangular inequality, a plus b, so you get x minus y plus 1. Can we also um, go ahead and, and start with uh, our assumption that x, uh, the absolute value of x minus y is less than or equal to 1 and use the other triangular inequality that we proved for one of the homeworks? Sure. Where the difference is always going to be less than or equal to the difference between the two values. Yes, but when you have to do that, usually you are complicating your problem. But that's fine. It's still going to be correct. Mm -hmm. And you, what you can do with the other uh, triangular inequality, you can always do with a plain triangular inequality. Okay. So, but that's, uh, you know, you, that's fine. It's, uh, so x minus y we know is less than 1, and y is less than 4. So we can just say, well, we are going to add, to, to replace this by 1, and replace this by 4, and therefore we get the 5 we needed. Okay? Now, the other inequality, The other inequality, you shouldn't start like this, because the, when you start like that, you are going to have x smaller than something. You want x bigger than something. So start with y instead, so that your x is on this side. Okay? So you would start with y equal to y minus x plus x, smaller than y minus x plus x. So exactly the symmetric thing, except this time starting with y instead of starting with x. 
And so we get x bigger than y minus y minus x. Okay, I have put this guy on this side, that's all. And now uh, we can, what can we do? We can say that y is bigger than 3, so x is bigger than uh, 3, and y minus x is less than 1. Okay, so why can I say this? You see, x minus y is the same as y minus x in absolute value, and is less than 1. That's what I'm using. But when I multiply by minus 1, I'm going to reverse the inequality, and I'll have that uh, minus y minus x is larger than minus 1, which is what I used here. Wait. Yes? Uh, could you do that again? Yeah. So my starting point is that y minus x is x minus 1 in absolute value. Right. It's two of the same thing. And I'm told that this is less than 1. That's the hypothesis. Now I multiply by minus 1, and I reverse my equality, I get this. Oh, yeah. And then I need y as well, so I add y on both sides. But y I know is bigger than 3. So this is bigger than 3 minus 1. So this is 2. So I get that this difference of absolute values is at least 2, which, which is what we need. Yeah. Yes? Would we have to explain that? Why you're allowed to do that? Why you're allowed to say the absolute value of y minus x? No, that's fine. If, uh, you know. Yeah, no, I, I just didn't know why we were uh, flipping those two since we didn't really need to. Oh, we don't need to? Well, here I, here I have y minus x instead of x minus y, right? Or oh, yeah, we assume that. Yeah, I, I mean, um, yeah. I'm not trying to confuse you. I'm just no. trying to be truthful to you know, what uh, the assumptions are here. OK, so we agree on that? <coughs> so typical triangular inequality, that's what you need to memorize to, to is, is really the technique. Add something. Use the triangle inequality, doesn't work, maybe try something else. Maybe try starting with y instead of x. Okay? There are a finite number of possibilities. Number So we are given a strictly positive number, and we ask to find a d so that the interval a minus d, a plus d, is on the positive side. So we want a minus d, a plus d, this interval here, to be on the positive side. So this looks a lot like the type of problems we have been doing with the epsilons when we want the sequence to be on, the, on some interval. And you do it in the same way. You say, well, one, one possibility would be to say a minus d is a over 2, or a over 4, or a over 16. Okay, that's, uh, uh, any of those are, is going to work. And then you get your d to be a minus a over 2, which is a over 2. If you do that, you have a over 2 here, and you have 3a over 2 here. So that's what we needed, right? We needed to have a, an interval on the strictly positive side. So how do we write that out kind of the, the right way? I'm, I mean, I can just say d equals a over 2 intuitively, you know? But do I then say, um, uh, do I need to prove that a over 2 is also going to be greater than 0? You just say it. a is greater than 0, therefore a over 2 is greater than 0. Okay. 
and then I just say, and then we get a minus d equals a over two, and okay. It's almost a, it's a problem where the picture tells you more than what you can write. I mean, you want us to draw the picture? That's always helpful because it tells me that even if you have not been able to write things right, I know that at least you had the right idea or the wrong idea. So, you know, it, uh, it uh, definitely uh, helps. Okay. And it helps you, I think, to, to draw pictures. So four, we have a between zero and one over n, and that must be true for all n. Then show that a is zero. You you could use your Archimedean property. But if there is even something simpler to do, which is using the squeezing principle, 0 converges to 0, 1 over n converges to 0, and therefore uh, a must be 0. Okay? The, you could say that your uh, sequence, your constant sequence a, converges to 0, therefore is 0. Okay? So, I mean, your, your conclusion here is that a is between 0 and 0. Or you can think of operations on limits. You can, if you have, if the limits exist on both sides, you can pass to the limit, and your strict inequality becomes large inequality. That's a rule you can apply over time. Okay. So in a case like that, uh, the limits exist, of course, because this is a constant, this is a constant, and this converges. So I pass to the limit everywhere, and my inequalities become large. And therefore, I end up with a between 0 and 0, and therefore a is 0. Okay. Do we, can we just say it like that, that 1 over n converges to 0? We yeah. Need to prove it? No, no. That, everything that has been proved in class or in the homework is a known fact. You don't need to reprove it. You just, okay. But it's always good to, to say what you're doing to justify it. Other questions? By, by the Archimedean property, you could do a proof by contradiction. Assume that a is not 0, then you would get that your n is always less than 1 over a. And that's a contradiction of the Archimedean property. You are done. Okay. Can you explain the, um, the one you were talking about, the limit property? So the limit property is the following. If I have a n less than b n, it doesn't matter if it's strict or large here, okay, or large. Then, and, and I know, and that's important, and I know that I have convergence of my two sequences. Then I have the following. I know that the following is true. I can use this. Okay, so, so that's the property we are using here. But again, you can use this property when you know that the limits exist. If not, you know you are you are using this to to prove that the limit exists, but you are assuming that the limit exists. So to do that, so that's not good. Yes. You just said that, that zero is a, a lower bound for sequence, and therefore a has to be less than or equal. If it's a lower bound, then I mean, it, I'm sorry, the, the greatest lower bound. So A is Oh, the sequence one over n. Yes. Okay, yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. Number five. So you want to show that x over one minus x is bigger than four thirds of x. 
when your x is between one fourth and three fourth. Now, uh, the ugly way to do that is to start with this and try to massage it into something you know is true. Okay, so you multiply, you do things, and you have a quadratic, you solve it, whatever. That's, but that's not really the best way to do things. The best way to do things is to think, well, here I have an expression x over 1 minus x. What I want to do is really get rid of the 1 over 1 minus x and replace it by a constant. That's all. So I'm going to start with uh, 1 over bounds for x. Uh, let's say we start with x bigger than 1 fourth. Okay, that's given to us. Then we multiply by minus 1 because we want, we want to uh, find something about 1 over 1 minus x. So we multiply by minus x, by minus 1, I'm sorry. Then 1 minus x is less than 1 minus 1 fourth, which is 3 fourth. Both over. Good, but how do you know these are positive numbers? Uh, we know that x is going to be less than 3 fourths, so we can say that 1 minus x is going to be greater than 0. Good. You need to, do, to say all that. Okay? You need to say that 1 minus x is positive, and that's because x is less than 3 fourths. And you know, of course, that uh, 1 fourth is positive. And then you say that uh, one over, yeah, one over x is decreasing on the positive. So when you take the inverse here, you get one over one minus x is bigger than four thirds. And we are done because we got rid of the one over one minus x. Okay, we have a constant now. We can multiply across by x, and that's because x is positive, and we get x over 1 minus x larger than 4 thirds of x. Questions? So uh, this method may you may have a little, of, uh, the little bit of trouble that may come comes from the fact that uh, you need to think a little bit in advance uh, what this function is really doing. What it's doing, it's a minus here and then an inverse. So you're doing two things that are reversing inequalities. If you reverse inequalities twice, you're not reversing. And therefore, if you start with larger than, you should end up with larger than. The other possibility is just to try out. Okay, you start with x bigger than one fourth. It doesn't work. You try the other one. Uh, so you know there are two possibilities. It's not like so. Which is what B does. Let's. So now we want to compute same thing, but we want an upper bound. So because we want an upper bound, I would start with x less than three fourth. Then minus x is bigger than minus three fourth. 1 minus x is bigger than 1 minus 3 fourths. And 1 over 1 minus x is therefore less than 1 over 1 fourth. <coughs> and therefore, x over 1 minus x is less than 4x. Okay, I can be a little quicker here because x is in the same range as before and therefore the same properties that I used here hold and I can do all that. So my c is really 4. That's all. C is one possibility. C equal 4 is one possibility. Well, no, just one. And you are right. I mean, you, you can sometimes, by, by being careful, more careful, you get a better constant. There are people who make a career of finding the best possible constant. That's, that's a hot subject sometimes. So, 
Number six. So in English, this set is a set of rationals that are strictly less than square root of 3. Why does it have a least upper bound? Well, by the fundamental property of the reals. OK? And that's all we have to buy the fundamental property of the reals? No, because the fundamental property of the reals applies under certain conditions. And you need to check that the conditions hold here. OK? Otherwise, you don't get full credit. Not even half, actually. So what you do, what are the two conditions we need to check to apply the fundamental property? The non -empty set. So non-empty, what would you say? One is in there. One is in there. That's fine. OK? So one belongs to B. B is not empty. That's our first one. Second uh, condition. Uh, it has a uh, upper bound. Which is? Square root of 3. Okay. It's given to you. So square root of 3 is an upper bound. <coughs> now you can apply the fundamental property of the reals and say very easily it's upper bound. Second question, let's uh, find the uh, least upper bound. Let's prove that it's square root of 3. So can we do contradiction? You can, but you don't have to in this case. I don't think you need a contradiction. Well, it's, since we already know that it's an upper bound, and we just say you know, if it's uh, anything greater than that, it no longer belongs to the set, and we're done. Right? That's so, a good uh, question. Uh, if you take something great. No, no, that's not what you want to do. You, you want to prove that it's the least upper bound. So you want to take something smaller than this and show that it's not an upper bound. Not being in the set is not proving anything. Square root of 3 is not in this set okay. in any case. Right. But. OK, so do, do we see that we have an upper bound? We want to show that it's the least upper bound. What do we do? We take a smaller number, and we show that it cannot be an upper bound. So we know we have a least when we do that. OK? So picture square root of 3 is here. And we take a number that we call uh, no, k. K. K is a natural norm. Uh, y, whatever. Uh, so we take a Y here, and square root of 3 is here, and we want to show that Y is not an upper bound of our set. In other words, we want to show that we can find a rational here between Y and square root of 3. So how do we know this is a true? statement that there is a rational between y that I don't know and square root of 3. Density of the rationals. Yeah. OK? So that's what we do. We start by saying take y less than square root of 3. Then by the density of the rationals, and don't say the density of the reals in the rationals. OK? That's Many people do that. Then by the density of the rationals in the reals, but you, you could ju just say density of the rationals, there is a rational r in uh, between y and square root of 3. So y is not. is not an upper bound of 
B. Okay? Now we know that this means that square root of 3 is the least upper bound. Yes? It's you can you can use the stronger statement which is strictly between. The the large with the large inequalities it's it's a weaker statement. Okay. And actually if you think about this, when you say that you have a rational between two rails, you actually have infinitely many rationals between two rails because you can start splitting your interval in smaller and smaller pieces and find as many rationals as you want. Okay? To this day, I'm not able to picture that in my head. Maybe one day. Anyway, so it's, it's a very deep property. Okay? It's something which is quite uh, useful and uh, is very useful. So uh, that was six. That also is a counterexample to show that the fundamental property does not hold for the rationals. Because we have found here a set which is non-empty, which is bounded above, but its least upper bound is not a rational. It doesn't exist in the rationals. Okay? That's a minor point, but really that's the difference between the reals and the rationals. Number seven. So you're told that uh, an to a power one over n converges to two. to prove an inequality on AN. You don't have much to work with but the definition of convergence. Okay? At the other extreme, if I'm talking about monotone sequence, then it's not the definition you should use usually. Usually you'll use the theorem that tells you that monotone plus bounded means convergent. Okay? So you really need to adjust your uh, technique depending on the way the, the question is phrased and where you are heading. Here we are heading to an inequality that's probably the, the epsilon definition that we need. So we write down that for every epsilon there exists a capital N so that if N is bigger than capital N then An to the power 1 over N minus 2 is smaller than epsilon. <coughs> Uh, as always, we can rewrite this as a double inequality, a n to the power 1 over n, between 2 minus epsilon and 2 plus epsilon. Uh, my inequality is an inequality with larger than 3 half. So clearly it's this one that I need. And clearly, I should pick epsilon equal half. Okay, so my starting point should have been, uh, let's take uh, epsilon equal half. Now we get a n to the power one over n uh, bigger than two minus half, which is three half. Okay, just using one side, and. We erase both sides at power n. Why can I do that? What property am I using? Your 
which which function is increasing? Uh, x, to the n. x to the n is increasing. That's what I'm doing. I'm saying if this is bigger than that, when I raise it to the power n, so when I take the function x to the n on both sides, the inequality remains the same. Okay. So what we're doing here is saying that the function x gives me x to the n is increasing. And about power functions and inequality, you have really to memorize the beautiful graph of page 35 okay, that summarizes everything you need to know about power functions and inequalities. Okay. No, no. So this is a parenthesis. What you what you have is that the function x to the n is doing this. The function uh, x to the 1 over n does this. And here you have a function y equal x. And it gives you all sorts of interesting inequalities. Okay, Which one is bigger than which? For which range? I should put that this is 1 and this is 1. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind because we'll, we'll have powers running around all the time and it's good to know when is, what is smaller than, than what and for which x. So uh, now by definition of the nth root, this is exactly a over n, a n in absolute value and you are done. Okay, so what this result does, and it's useful when you look at series, is tell you that when you take, when the nth root of a n goes to uh, something bigger than 1, you actually have a sequence, your sequence is increasing like at least a geometric. That's what this is telling you. So for number 8, we have a n converges to 0, and b n is strictly positive. Does a n over b n converge to 0? Uh, no. It's a resounding no, yes, because you can you know, do many uh, things like a n equal b n equal 1 over n, and uh, a n converges to 0. Uh, Bn is strictly positive, but when you do An over Bn, you get 1. It doesn't converge to 0. It may diverge, it may converge to 0, it may do a number of things. Number nine, we know that the an minus bn converges to zero. Does this imply that an and bn converge? No. No, again. Let them equal uh, the n natural. An equal n, and bn equal the same thing? Yeah. They're not bounded above, and yet they. Uh, okay, so the difference may go to zero, but uh, the. It doesn't mean that your sequences converge. Um, Since on your, yeah. uh, on your problems, uh, it's uh, every time it says prove it or give a counterexample, it seems like the answer is no automatically. I'll be I'll keep that in mind for the test. <laughs> oh, no, no, you keep the test easy. Just. For the book for the students next year. They so let me let work. me ask you an extra question here. Since uh, so, assume now that a n plus one minus a n goes to zero. Does this imply that a n converge? So now I'm looking just at two consecutive terms of my sequence, and the difference between two consecutive terms is going to zero. Does this mean that the sequence a n goes to zero as well? You are speechless all of a sudden. 
<laughs> no, does it converge? That's the question. Does A and converge? No, the answer is no, but that's that's a little more subtle. You need to to take a counterexample like a n equal to square root of n. And if you do that, you do square root of n plus 1 minus square root of n is going to be uh, 1 over square root of n plus 1 plus square root of n. This goes to 0. The difference goes to 0. But your sequence square root of n clearly does not, go to, does not converge. So uh, you, the answer to that one is no as well. Yes. Oh, I'm multiplying up and down by uh, square root of n plus 1 plus square root of n. These are the things that people do in algebra, but, but by the time you need it, really, you forgot it, of course. So it's not really. Okay, you, you multiply up and down by, I think they call this a conjugate expression or something of this type. And then you, you use a plus b times a minus b equal to a square minus b square, which in this case gives you n plus 1 minus n, which is 1. So it's 1 over square. And there are other examples. Just think of series, but I, I don't want to get into series. It's kind of intuitive, though, if you like think about the uh, square root function, and it doesn't uh, hit an asymptote there. It just continually goes parabolically, you know. Correct, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it has to do with the slope of uh, your function, exactly. Oh, so where were we? <coughs> Ten. Okay, so what we have here is an increasing sequence and a subsequence which is bounded. Okay. So what we know is that uh, C N K is less than M for all K. Okay, just notation here. The variable, when you're taking the subsequence, the variable is not n anymore. It's a k. Okay, it's the, the sub-index that, that is your variable. The, the reason you write it like this is just to indicate that you're doing something with the sequence here. So you have this. Now, I need to compare, and that's where uh, it's, uh, we are going to use, of course, that our uh, sequence is monotone, is increasing, we, we need to compare N, Cn and Cnk, or Ck and Cnk. And first thing, we need to compare Nk and K. So we have talked already about this. Do you remember how Nk and K relate? So I'm talking about Nk is the kth N I pick for my subsequence. Can I compare that to K? What can I say? Nk needs to be bigger than k. Do you see it? It's because you are, you are skipping terms. So n1 is at least 1. n2 may be 2 or 3 or 4. But it cannot be less than 2. And nk must be at least k. Because you may be taking all the terms, all the first k terms, but if you skipped even one term, your nk is strictly bigger than k. Okay, so if you just try to write it, you'll see, you'll see that this is a true statement. Is it okay to create a subsequence like uh, just eliminate the first uh, 
the first piece. So your subsequence goes uh, nk is equal to 2 and then 3 and then on and on like that? Uh, yeah, that will work if you do a shift to the right, yes. Okay. Yeah. So you get c and k larger than ck because it's an increasing function. So if the indices are in this order, the sequence is on the same order. Right? And therefore, because C and K is bounded by M, you must have that CK is less than M for all K in the naturals. Okay, and we proved that it's bounded. So it's a simple consequence of the fact that uh, when you're skipping terms, you are growing faster than when you are not, when you have an increasing uh, sequence. And if when skipping, you are bounded, when not skipping, you must be bounded as well. No, because the variable is k. I mean, that's a question of convention. Which page do you, do you have that? Oh, on the test. OK, where is it? Uh, on A, it says, uh, show the sequence CN is bounded above. Right, but, uh, but it's, it's just, you know, I could, instead of calling my sequence CN K, I could call it CKN, and then I can compare it to CN. I mean, just a question of uh, what your notation is. But usually the variable is the second index. That's why I compared it. But you see, proving something about CK is exactly the same thing as proving something about CN. That's my whole sequence. Yeah? OK? So show that the sequence CN converges, what would you say? Yeah, it's increasing bounded above. Yeah, bounded above and increasing, you are done. Okay, so uh, we call we can call this the monotone convergence theorem tells us that monotone uh, increasing rather plus bounded above implies convergence. Okay, last one. So we have a sequence in D which has a hole. So we have a sequence in 0, 1 and or 2, 3. And we are told that our sequence converges to 1. So we'll be able to pick an epsilon so that, for instance, uh, our sequence stays in 1 minus epsilon, 1 plus epsilon. Uh, maybe I should use some color. Yeah. Not great. Um, so what we want is our sequence to be in this interval, which is in uh, pink, and also in our set. But our set is these two pieces, 0, 1, and 2, 3. So if we are at the same time in both, well, there is no choice. We must be only in 0, 1. Okay, we cannot uh, be over that because the sequence is not there. 
Okay? So now that I have the normal picture, I can prove this. It's, uh, which epsilon should I take? Which epsilon is going to half? Yeah, absolutely. Epsilon equal one half is going to work because uh, it's going to put me in the middle. What I don't want is take an epsilon equal five because then uh, you know, it's going to overlap and I won't be able to, to see anything. But anything being smaller than one is going to be fine. So, uh, epsilon equal half, the reason n, so that if n is bigger than capital N, then a n minus one is less than half. So we get our double inequality. A n is between half and three half. Um, and A n is always in zero one union two three. But if we are less than three half, we cannot be here. It's not possible. So we must be here. So for n larger than capital N, a n must belong to 0, 1. We could even say that uh, between 1 half and 1. Yes, you could say that it's between 1 half and 1, which would be more precise than this, absolutely. Because we know we must be above 1 half. Do you care if we do an answer like that, or if what? Do, do you care if we if we do a more precise answer, or no? That's better. That's that's good. Okay. Yes. Saying that it's in zero or one is all you need. You don't even have to say it converges to one at that point. All you know is since it's in zero or one, it's always less than or equal. Yes. And uh, the convergence is the, your hypothesis. That's what you are using to get there. So it's not a bad review, but uh, we haven't seen any application of bolzano verstrass in here. And I'm not sure whether you know, that's something we'll be using actually more in chapter 5 and 6. But you may have a question on bolzano verstrass You need to know that theorem. Uh, we haven't talked about the well-ordering principle. You may also have a question on that. That's, um, you know, if you are in the naturals, you have a subset of naturals. Your subset is non-empty. It has a minimum. That's quite useful. What else have we missed? What problems would you like to see in the test you haven't seen in the review? Some uh, simple algebra. So concentrate on the simple questions. Okay, you need to, to make sure you understand the basics. We, most of what we did so far is quite elementary, so it's not, but don't you know, waste time on things that you think are complicated or you are, you're not really grasping very well. Concentrate on the you know, easy stuff first, and then you can build from there. When, when writing your proofs, always remember, these are very short proofs. I never write more than three or four lines. If you are writing two pages, you are not on the right track. Okay? So try to be simple. Try to get the idea first, draw a picture, have some idea of what, where you are heading, and then do it. Yes? What's your policy on notes? No notes. No notes. You, there, there is a certain amount of memorization in this class. And that helps you, actually, because you get used to some techniques. And it's good to have them, I think, memorized. It, uh, it just helps you do more things after a while. So have we reviewed enough, or do you feel like uh, you have been shortchanged once again. Well, I'd like to see an application uh, of the uh, lower principle on the Balzano work, uh, Verstrass. OK. That's a fair request. So
Yeah. Very stress? Yeah. Yeah, we haven't done much about that. That's true. Is that the one with the subsequences? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, if you have convergence, uh, if you have a bounded sequence, then you have a convergent subsequence. Hmm. And the well ordering principle is the one where uh, A is in the bre uh, A is in the naturals and it's non empty. Correct. Okay. And it has a minimum. Yes. Okay, so let me one example I can think of is the following. Okay, well, yeah. So, uh, assume you have a sequence. In the interval A, B. Then, Show that there is a subsequence X and K <coughs> converging to L in AB. So there are two pieces of information. Uh, well, two, two things to prove. One, that you have a subsequence that converges. Two, that the limit belongs to the set AB. So what can I say about the sequence XN? It's bounded because it's between A and B. So that's a bounded sequence. Okay. Xn is between A and B, so Xn is bounded. Now, by Bolzano Verstrass, who are two great mathematicians uh, from Germany from the 19th century, you get that there exists. A subsequence X and K that converges because that's uh, what the theorem tells you. Bounded sequence, subsequence that converges. So we can call it L. And now you have that your x and k is also between A and B. Okay, because these are terms of the same sequence, so it must be that uh, uh, the same bounds apply to this subsequence. And when you do operations on limits, this goes to L, this goes to A, and this goes to B. So yes, your limit is between A and B. Okay, so uh, the type of thing you 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 get if you get something about boson stress are of this type. Right? This is this is the, the inequality, the passage to the limit we were talking about. Yes. Just to clarify, even with this theorem, we can't say it converts to any particular limit. No, we, we don't uh, have any clue about what the limit exists. The only thing is, we know there is a limit. And it can, we can tell us it's A and B. I'm sorry? And we can take, yes, yes, it's between A and B. OK. 
Okay, uh, for the well-ordering principle, we could could do something like this. Take R to be a rational, then show that there is a smallest natural n such that n square root of uh, n r is a natural. Okay. So you have a rational. You want to, to show that you can actually pick a small as possible natural so that the n times r is uh, a natural. That, that has to do, of course, with uh, having the rational uh, in irreducible form, okay? because the smallest possible n will give you uh, the irreducible form. So how do you do this? Well, you could, uh, in order to prove the existence of the smallest natural, that should ring a bell, say, oh, smallest natural, that means well during principle. Okay, well, the in principle that applies to subsets of naturals. So let's define a subset of naturals which is natural, which is A equal to the set of naturals so that NR is a natural as well. And what we're asking really is to show that we have a minimum element in this set A. Okay? The set A is in the naturals, so that's a good beginning for the well-ordering principle. You need to have your set in the naturals, no, nowhere else. And second thing you want to show that it's not empty. So it's not empty. Well, if R is, a, is a rational, it must have some fraction representation. My R must be A over B for some A uh, for some naturals A and B. Uh, to simplify things, let's let's take R to be positive, so that we know that we can take A and B to be positive, uh, therefore natural numbers. So why is uh, A a non-empty set? What uh, element can you put in A? B. You can put B in A because if you do BR, you get A, and A is a natural. So B belongs to A, which means that A is not empty. And therefore, the well-ordering principle tells you that minimum of A exists. That's exactly what you want. There is a minimum natural so that n times r is a natural. Okay, so that's very typical of the world ordering principle. And there's a well ordering principle for the reals? No. That's strictly uh, natural. It's you know it has to do with the fact that you are dealing with, with a discrete set that has holes, constant holes, and you can do that. If it's real, you cannot ensure to have a minimum. Many sets in the reals have no minimum. 
when you said is the well-ordered principle as it applies to the naturals, so you can apply it to any discrete set principle to the Well, you need to be careful about what your set does exactly, but certainly it needs to be discrete, but that's not quite enough. Okay, so let's stop here for today, and I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>